This video will contain spoilers for Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition and Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Your research notes really helped. Okay, but what even is this thing? Not in terms of lore, because there's already videos explaining that. What I should ask is, what's the Monado's real-world inspiration? The word Monado comes from the word monad, which is a concept seen in various philosophies and religions across history. The term was first coined by the ancient Greeks, meaning unity or lone. It referred to a supreme being representing the origin and unity of all things, so it's essentially the Western conception of God. The concept was later revived by German mathematician and philosopher Gottfried Leibniz in his 1714 work, The Monadology. The story and lore of Xenoblade 1 is deeply influenced by this work, and it will be the focus of today's video. I'll start with a brief explanation of the text, and then I'll go over various connections I made to the story of Xenoblade while I read. So to start, what is a monad according to Leibniz? He describes monads as a simple substance that is indivisible and lacks any smaller parts. If you're having trouble imagining it, think of it as an atom. Wait, that's no good. Atoms have smaller parts like protons and electrons. And come to think of it, those have smaller parts too, like quarks. Okay, since modern science wants to prove Leibniz wrong, how about instead of equating monads to atoms like he does, we call them elementary particles. Party what? Although monads are still quite a bit different. They're the building blocks of the universe according to Leibniz, hence the comparison to physics. Yet they themselves are incorporeal, meaning that they're not physical objects. So think of monads as a spiritual type of particle instead. Physical bodies are derived from monads, but they're separate. Let's continue. Monads were all created at once when the universe began, and can only be destroyed all at once. Because monads make up complex substances, which he refers to as composites, and composites have different traits from one another, this means each monad must be unique in order to produce these traits, because where else would these traits come from? This right here is the juicy bit. Every action and change to a monad must come from within itself, because according to Leibniz, they're immune to any external stimuli, and do not react to anything other than its own existence. But how can actions come from within the monad if it has no smaller parts? To remedy this, Leibniz describes them as being like souls. They have perceptions and desires. Souls, however, are capable of storing memories which grants them more complexity. When a person goes to sleep, they're unable to store memories, so the soul is temporarily placed in a monad-like state during this time. So you could consider monads a type of proto-soul. He also says later in paragraph 82 that like monads, all souls and animals were created at the beginning of the world and cannot truly die unless the whole world ends. Moving on. It says in paragraph 47, God alone is the ultimate unity or the original simple substance, of which all created or derivative monads are the products, meaning that monads emanate from God's being. He goes on to add that monads contain God's ideas, knowledge, and his will. They're automatons programmed to enact God's will. Sometimes monads might have conflicting goals, but because a perfect god cannot allow any contradictions in how the world works, and since monads can't act upon each other, meaning they can't decide which action will take priority, sometimes god must directly intervene to give one monad's action priority over another. Let's wrap up this lesson. Leibniz says, Bodies act as if there were no souls at all, and souls act as if there were no bodies and yet both body and soul act as if one were influencing the other. In other words, the body is purely physical, and the soul or mind is immaterial. They only appear to interact with each other because they've been programmed in advance by God's will to create an illusion of interaction. 
All events must be predetermined in the mind of God for this illusion to work so perfectly. This illusion of interaction is what Leibniz refers to as the pre-established harmony. So yeah, the text is really dense despite its short length, and if you're like me and not very religious, this whole thing seems like one big schizo post from Leibniz. But with that explanation out of the way, how about we apply it to Xenoblade? A straightforward interpretation is that Zanza, Maynith, and later Shulk are as gods the supreme substance. The Monado and Alvis are obviously monads. Due to Alvis's nature as a computer, he only carries out the commands of the computer's administrators, Klaus and Galea. Shulk is declared the new god after Zanza's death, granting him their administration privileges. As a machine, Alvis is a literal automaton, containing the ideas and knowledge of the gods. He carries out their will through Zanza's visions, or by granting Shulk's wish for a world with no gods. Pretty clear connections, I'd say. Although I'm not entirely satisfied with that interpretation. It makes sense, yes, but the game's Gnostic symbolism is sometimes at odds with the monadology. After all, one of the biggest reveals is that Alvis was the one true god all along, not Zanza. I have another possible interpretation of the story that goes a lot deeper, so buckle up. Let me start with something that might already be controversial. The Monado is not a monad, and neither is Alvis. Wait, 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 I promise it'll make sense. I promise it'll make sense. Don't click off the video. <sighs> okay, you still watching? So you might bring up the scene at the end where Alvis says, I am Monado, as a counterpoint. That use of Monado isn't in reference to monadology, though. It's in reference to Gnosticism, in which the Gnostics referred to God as the monad. So there's an example of the overlap with Gnosticism making it a bit tricky. Based on the monad's description as being simple substances that make up reality, I think ether particles are more likely candidates. Monads are also described as proto-souls, and ghosts are confirmed to exist in the game, so we know that there are souls in the world of Xenoblade. And since all life on Bionis when it dies returns its ether energy to the Bionis, I'm inclined to believe that souls and ether are somewhat related as well. So what is the Monado if it's not actually a monad? Well, since the Monado is a tool that can control ether particles, and we've established that ether particles are monads, then we can just say the Monado is the tool that lets the user control monads. The Monado is a divine sword capable of disturbing the very fabric of existence of both the material and the immaterial. But where does that tool come from? We've established that only God, the supreme substance, can control monads. That appears to be Zanza at first, because he's in control of the Monado for most of the game. But as mentioned, the Gnostic symbolism makes things a little trickier to pinpoint. But the game makes it abundantly clear that Alvis is the true god of the Xenoblade 1 universe. Here we have some lore you'd only get from playing Xenoblade Chronicles 2. In that game, it's implied that all ether energy comes from the Conduit. During his first fight with Mithra, Malos says that she, and presumably all Aegises, draw their power directly from the Conduit instead of their surroundings. Wait, um, she's not drawing from the ether, it's something else. Klaus later confirms this outright. The power you and Numa exercise is the conduit's power. It comes leaking out of some far-flung dimension. The world of Allrest contains ether, but the world of Bionis and Makanis is chock full of the stuff, because the conduit created the entire universe out of it. So we know that all ether is derived from the conduit now. The conduit had the power to create the universe, and Alvis was the one with the consciousness capable of giving anything form. Alvis disappears at the end of the game, presumably with the Conduit. Their being linked for so long leads me to believe that maybe they've become permanently linked into a singular entity, with Alvis's consciousness and the Conduit's power. But even without that last bit of headcanon, I think we can safely say that Alvis is meant to parallel Leibniz's description of God, 
since all ether is derived from Alvis and the Conduit, just as monads are derived from God, they carry Alvis's will and knowledge. Alvis can see the future without a monado, not only because he's an omnipotent god, but because as monads, the ether particles are trying to enact his will and create the future that he first envisioned when the universe was created. So since the monado grants clairvoyance by predicting the movement of ether particles, you could, in a sense, say that it's looking into Alvis's mind when it does that. Let's move on to what you were all probably waiting for when you heard it during the initial explanation. On Prison Island, Zanza tells Maynith, I see now. It is as I suspected. You exist outside the pre-established harmony. What did he mean by this? It's really tricky, but I think I've come up with a good enough explanation. Zanza believes he's the one true god. Because of this belief, he thinks he's the one from which all ether is derived, with it containing all of his knowledge and desires. So in his mind, the universe itself is trying to uphold his will. Maynith, however, is a fellow god. Since she didn't come from Zanza, he can't control her using the Monado. It's also hinted at that Zanza can't predict everything Maynith will do using the Monado. However, I came to possess a great and unexpected power. Maynith's Monado. Correct. However, I had no idea that I would defeat her so easily. All of this leads me to believe that the reason Zanza didn't know this was because the Monado can't show him things outside the pre-established harmony, like, say, another god. This is admittedly a little iffy when you remember that, again, Alvis is the real god, not Zanza. It would only make sense if Alvis was, for whatever reason, purposefully withholding information from Zanza. But then again, he did withhold that whole I am Monado thing, so I think it's in character, at least. But returning to the topic at hand, I believe that the pre-established harmony is synonymous with the term the game likes to use, the passage of fate. With the way monadology works, of having God plan everything out to a T from the very beginning to uphold this illusion of causality, the philosophy is inherently deterministic. Although, Leibniz might be a bit hesitant to go all the way to determinism. He didn't want to dismiss the possibility of free will altogether. But that's irrelevant for now. Shulk, like Maynith, is not under Zanza's control after Makana's core, because he is no longer within the pre-established harmony. That's why in memory space, Zanza is unable to see the future past a certain point. And don't think that limit only applies to Zanza. Alvis himself admits before Makana's core that he has no clue how things will play out afterwards. This might be an answer to that Maynith inconsistency from earlier. Media takes creative liberties all the time. The parallels don't have to be perfect to the inspiration. So yeah, I guess Alvis isn't completely omniscient. But back to Shulk. Why is he suddenly immune to the passage of fate? Why is he outside the pre-established harmony? I always considered this to be a loose end since I first played the game, but I think now I've figured it out. Monads, and hence ether particles, are proto-souls. So if Zanza and Alvis can see and manipulate the future using proto-souls, perhaps they can do the same using real souls. But Shulk has no soul. He died in Ase Tower as a kid, and Zanza stated to have served as his life force. You grew up with an empty shell. He appeared to live because I became his life force. Okay, just a disclaimer, when philosophers like Leibniz use the word soul, it's usually used interchangeably with mind or consciousness, which Shulk clearly has. But if we take it to mean life force, I think it ties up that loose head nicely, even if it is admittedly a bit of a stretch. Back to your regularly scheduled program. So as far as my theory goes, because the Monado can only predict the future, using ether and souls that come from God, and Shulk no longer has a soul, once Zanza leaves his body, the Monado can't find anything that contains the knowledge and will of the gods, so without Zanza, the Monado becomes useless at predicting Shulk's future. 
And if you believe that Alvis shared his soul with Shulk through a form of blade resonance later on, I would just chalk it up to the Monado being possibly unable to see the future of God himself. Supporting this, Alvis doesn't appear in a single one of Shulk's visions of the future. He only appears in dreams or in memory space. And with that, I think we've covered the most important bits. Now I'd like to go over some of the connections I made to monadology that I couldn't organically fit into that previous section. These upcoming connections probably weren't intentional on the part of the writers, but anything is possible, and I think it's interesting enough to warrant taking a look. Leibniz states in paragraph 64, the every organic body of a living being is a kind of divine machine or natural automaton. He then goes on to say that man-made machines can never compare to those made by nature. This is because natural machines contain an immaterial divine aspect to them, whereas man-made machines will always be purely physical. It might be a bit of a stretch, but this brings the Mechon to mind. Egil seeks to destroy the Bionis and creates the Mechon. The Mechon are easily defeated by the Monado and the Homs, God's divine machines. Even the faced Mechon, despite containing a natural element through the use of Homs, are imperfect. Mumkar and Gado are disfigured, Zord is insane, and the Monado's secret files confirms he has no human body anymore. He's just a mass of organs implanted into a Mechon frame. Even after creating something so grotesque, the Monado can still defeat them with ease once its shackles are released. The people of Bionis, because they're natural automatons, will always be superior and thus able to defeat the Mechon, man-made automatons. This next connection I think was very intentional. In paragraph 88, Leibniz states that the harmony upheld by God's rule means all things will progress towards grace, the best possible outcome. The earth must be destroyed and restored through natural means if God deems it necessary, as either a reward or a punishment. He is a god. Such morals cannot apply to gods. So you think we should just shut up and die? If that is the fate decided by a god. This could be applied to either Zanza or Alvis. Zanza is obviously doing it as punishment for everyone rebelling against him. As for Alvis, I wouldn't really consider it a reward. He states the world can't survive as is without a god unless he resets it. However, I have good reason. This world has little time remaining if left in this state. Remember, as a machine, Alvis only takes commands from the computer administrators. So whose will are the ether particles going to uphold without Zanza or Shulk directing him? If you really want to consider it a reward though, you could consider it Shulk's reward for defeating Zanza the Demiurge. And finally, Leibniz states in paragraph 83 that souls are the living mirrors of God. They can come to understand the way of the universe, and of imitating some features of it by means of artificial models, each spirit being like a small divinity within its own sphere. The party can manipulate Aether through Ricky, Melia's elementals, and even Sharla's rifle. Egil created Mechon and became the soul of the Mechonis through his plan. Mikol and Shulk were able to make their own Monado replicas. These are all ways of understanding the ways of the universe and imitating it through artificial means. Then you must find your Monado. Could potentially be in reference to the last part of that quote, of each soul containing a small divinity. Each soul in the Xenoblade universe has a divine intelligence, and although imperfect, it can create things just like God can. Although those creations will also be imperfect, as described with the Mechon earlier, and the Monado replicas being unable to predict the future. I'm feeling it! No! I can't see it! This is the power of a god! And would you look at that, it looks like we've covered everything. Doing research for this video, I couldn't help but feel impressed by how competently put together the story is, despite there being so many references. I honestly find it commendable that these games can combine so many elements from their inspirations without having the story turn out completely incomprehensible. I hope this video helped you learn something, or at the very least gain a new appreciation for the game. Okay, but one more thing before the video ends. This has always bothered me. Why did they translate the word Monado the way they did? 
In Japanese, the katakana for monado is this, monado. But because of the way the Japanese language works, it requires consonants to have a vowel sound attached to them. That extra O at the end has to be included. If you look up the Japanese spelling online, the very first result is monad. Why did the localization choose to call it monado instead of just monad? The game was initially called Monado Beginning of the World, but again, why wasn't it called Monad Beginning of the World? Did they just think Monado sounded better? Is there an actual reason for this? Does anyone know? Hey there. Thanks for sticking around until the end. If you enjoyed, make sure to leave a like and share your thoughts in the comments. Also be sure to subscribe for more gaming, anime, and philosophy-related content in the future. Catch you in the next one!